Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work. Uh, I also thank them for having this in this uh, beautiful city. It's my first time in uh, Prague. And uh, I thank all of you who are still uh, kind of hanging in there for the last talk. Uh, so you're both brave and kind. So my topic is understanding uh, human knockouts. And what do we mean by knockouts? So essentially, when we think of knockouts um, in model organisms, we think of uh, looking at the function of a gene by disrupting it in some fashion or the other. And we call that a knockout of a gene. What do we mean in the context of human knockouts is with all the sequencing capability now, we are able to look at uh, variations that could potentially uh, lead to loss of function of the genes. And these, huh, I don't know why it went forward. Oh. And, and so these homozygous variants which can lead to a loss of function of the gene are referred to as human knockouts. So specifically, we are looking at a class of variants which are premature stop codons, uh, SNPs that lead to premature stop codons, SNPs that could disrupt canonical splice sites and frame shift causing indels, and large structural variants that can take out partially some genes or large numbers of genes. So when we think of loss of function, several people, I've seen many different kinds of people when I talk to them about my work, and they say, oh, you have a stop mutation. It must be really bad. And then I've spoken to my biologist colleagues who say, oh, yes, it's going to lead to loss of function because of nonsense-mediated decay. And then there are several others who say, it's probably not even expressed. Why do you think it's such a big deal that we have loss of function variants? So if you look at this um, picture, what I'm illustrating is that the impact of loss of function can be very varied. When it's very severe, you never even see that variant because it's embryonic lethal. And on the other end of the spectrum, you don't really need the gene or it doesn't affect uh, the fitness of the organism. So you see common variation. So along the spectrum, what I'm showing is increasing frequency as you go down. So it can be embryonic lethal. You could have uh, diseases due to haploinsufficiency. You could have diseases because of recessive uh, mutations of loss of function. And there may be involvement of uh, loss of function variants in complex diseases. So why is it interesting? It's precisely interesting for all the reasons that I mentioned. Uh, about 12% of the mutations in human gene mutation database are due to nonsense mutations. And uh, because of this, there's a lot of things that we can understand when we uh, evaluate exome sequencing of disease patients, and we can annotate Mendelian families. Um, there are other things that I have actually included, and this is from a paper that was published in Trends in Genetics. But the most exciting, especially since I'm working in a pharmaceutical company now, is that corner where it says drug development. So this table actually shows that recently people have been very excited about genes that seem to harbor a loss of function variants, but are actually uh, beneficial for the human being. So in this slide, I'm actually showing loss of function variants in a few genes, all of which seem to favorably affect lipid profile. And what this means is that in case of people with uh, problems related to lip, uh, cholesterol and other related factors, inhibiting these genes could potentially be therapeutically valuable. And earlier, Emre actually mentioned that with statins, a subset of people never really reached the clinical endpoint. So this actually is a way for um, identifying naturally occurring variation in human beings by the lot of sequence we do and try to potentially find beneficial mutations and then use this as a therapeutic strategy for inhibition of genes that could be conferring a protective benefit. So the questions I wanted to address are, do loss of function mutations really lead to loss of function mutation? And if they do, how do they affect uh, the fitness of the organism? Uh, understanding loss of function mutation is not as trivial as people seem to think, or at least some people seem to think. 
because um, I have illustrated here in case one and case two. In case one, there is a SNP in the second exon, which is actually 50 base pairs upstream of the exon-exon junction. And it is known empirically that when there is a stop mutation 50 base pairs upstream, it could potentially be degraded by nonsense-mediated decay and lead to loss of function. However, if you have a um, mutation, let's say, in the last exon, some people believe perhaps uh, it's not going to lead to, lead to loss, loss of function because it's not degraded by NMD. But I have illustrated here that perhaps it disrupts a protein domain and affects function. And we also know that NMD is not 100% efficient and it's an empirical rule which doesn't work all the time. So interpreting a nonsense mutation is not as straightforward as we actually think it is. On top of that, there is also complexities that can arise from the existence of different isoforms. So here I'm showing examples where a SNP affects only one isoform, as in case one, whereas in case two, it's a stop mutation where um, both isoforms are affected, and it's not clear how it would affect loss of function. So to essentially understand, we developed a predictive model to figure out what stop mutations uh, would do. And uh, I highlight here a few features that I've used uh, in terms of functional features, uh, network features, and evolutionary features, essentially because all prediction programs clearly show that conservation is very important, and we use network features more to see how important a gene is, and a lot of uh, functional features, especially to understand what is the region that is truncated once we uh, lose, uh, lose that region. So uh, totally we used 108 features, and I used a random forest classifier, and um, did a three-class classification where I tried to discriminate between benign variants and variants that would lead to dominant disease, that is a heterozygous loss of function variant, versus a variant that would lead to disease only when it is recessive disease. Um, this was done with the tenfold cross validation, and the results are uh, pretty good for a three-class classifier. So this is just a workflow, and the entire uh, software is available at aloft.com. KirstenLab.org, and I'm going to show you some examples where we, I show that this method really works. So here we are looking at a set of mutations from ClinVa, which are not included in the training set, and they are pathogenic. In panel one, I show that ALOF discriminates between dominant and recessive causing disease genes pretty well, and it also clearly shows that the benign one has a very low uh, disease causing score. I compare it with GURP and CAD score. GURP is a measure of evolutionary uh, conservation, and CAD score, which is uh, also very widely used. And you can see those two methods are not able to differentiate between variants that can actually cause disease in a dominantly acting fashion versus those that cause disease in a recessive fashion. Here I'm showing examples where we applied this uh, classifier to understand de novo loss of function variants in autism cases. And it's known that uh, in cases, there is an excess of deleterious loss of function variation. And if you look at the second panel and the first panel, you'll clearly see that the unaffected, which are in the first panel, have a lower um, proportion of deleterious loss of function variants. And what's more interesting, it is known that females have some kind of a protective effect in terms of getting autism. However, if when they do get autism, it's pretty severe. And if you look at the fourth panel, you would note that um, the disease-causing ALOF score that is predicted is pretty high. Finally, I show one other example where we looked at somatic premature stop variants. And the green curve is actually showing the proportion of uh, deleterious loss of function variants as a function of all of the loss of function variants you see in those samples. It's pretty high for driver events compared to random genes that we see uh, in the lower uh, parts of the curve. So what I've shown is that we've developed a three-class classifier. It's able to classify loss of function variants as heterozygous, dominant acting, homozygous recessive acting, and benign variants. I've shown a bunch of different cases where uh, it works very well, and I validate ALOFT. 
Um, if you go to the website, you can actually download exome-wide scores for all possible premature stop mutations for both HEGI-19 and HEGI-38 versions. Finally, I would like to thank all the people who worked with me on this. I did this work primarily at Yale, and um, I had some fantastic team members highlighted in bold there. I worked as a senior scientist in Mark Gerstein's lab for several years, and uh, I collaborated with Daniel MacArthur in Mastin Hospital in a thousand genomes project and continued on this project. Daniel and Conrad provided me with um, per sample data on uh, exact samples, and I currently work at Region Ron Genetic Center. I'm including them in the acknowledgement. They paid for me to come here to talk about work from Yale. And thanks to all of you for listening. I also want to mention that Region Ron has a fantastic postdoctoral program and lots of internships if anybody is interested. Thank you. Thank you, Sugandhi. Any questions? Okay. Thank you.